Hi. In sixth grade, I felt like my future was almost preordained. My mom, Cindy, was the original inventor, I think, of helicopter mom parenting. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. I was raised on organic food. You could find absolutely every non-gender assigning toy in my toy box, but you couldn't find a grain of sugar anywhere. My family is incredibly educated. Even my grandmothers who were born in the Depression went, managed to find their ways to universities and get degrees. My sister, Allison, who is also a part of the first piece of framed artwork I ever had, I took a pen to a photo, as you guys can see, and that was my first framed piece of art. I grew up in Elk Grove, a suburb of Sacramento, in a four-bedroom, two-and-a-half bathroom track home. My mom drove a minivan to every single imaginable lesson that Cindy could find for my sister and I. In first grade, I was diagnosed with dyslexia when I couldn't figure out how to read. So, you know, still to this day, being popcorn to in an outdoor or out loud reading exercise is somewhat terrifying. But my mom made sure that I was given tutoring and so I could figure out how to make the way that my brain works an asset instead of a handicap. All of this gave me a crazy amount of confidence. I ran track, I played the piano, I was in student council, and an amazing amount of activities. My mom encouraged me to sign up and apply in college for whatever degree that I wanted to take the most classes in, which ended up being art. And so at Chico State, with my overconfidence, I found myself in this amazing art department that I didn't fit into at all. The kids there that were painting alongside me had backgrounds of child abuse. They were bullied in school. A lot of them didn't have a mom like Cindy. And all of a sudden, they had access to a depth of emotion that I just honestly didn't have. If I had an edge, it would be dipped in glitter. I am an effervescent, happy person. And so for me to be in this situation with all these artists creating this incredibly edgy artwork, I felt boring and ordinary. I didn't really feel like I had a story to tell. And so I graduated college, and with my brand spanking new shiny art degree, I got a job as a waitress, and Cindy was horrified. I think Shirley Ruth, my grandmother, probably turned in her crave. But luckily, an amazing banker took a liking to me and asked me on a date. And he had multiple rental homes and a whole future in front of him and a retirement account. And I said, no. And so he asked again, and I said, no. And then he asked again, and I finally said yes. And my mom was so relieved. I had a date to my sister's wedding. And soon after that, I had a wedding of my own. Dennis told me I could pick anywhere in the entire world to go get married. And I chose the Alhambra Palace in Granada, Spain, because during getting my art degree, I studied the Alhambra Palace, which has Moorish architecture, which is absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I always wanted to see the Court of Four Lions. For our honeymoon, he took me to Rome so I could see the Sistine Chapel ceiling for myself. And it was incredible. Dennis was the most loving, amazing, interesting, nurturing man who his life thing that he really wanted was to have kids more than anything else. So after 36 hours of labor, we welcomed my son, Hunter Scott, into the world. And Hunter was the cutest little baby, so perfect. Big bright eyes, dimples. I never changed a dirty diaper when, 
when Dennis was home. Every day, Dennis and I, we'd come home from work, and I would be sitting on the front porch with Hunter in my lap, waiting for him to, be, to come home and be a family. And it was absolutely incredible until... And I was completely ill-equipped to have to raise a baby into a world where monsters were always going to be real. My childhood was so idyllic, Cindy made sure that it was. How was I going to teach him that life was beautiful in a world where kids get shot sitting at their kindergarten desks? where families are killed at a Walmart on a Sunday buying school supplies. I was lost, and I didn't know what to do. And so all of a sudden, those tragedies and depth of emotion that I didn't think I was even capable of maybe feeling, all of a sudden were were my story. It wasn't a story of somebody else that I went to art school with. All of a sudden... I had access to that, to that edgy, dark place where you don't know if there's ever going to be light again. And so I got out my art supplies, and I really wanted to make a painting where I would paint every inch of Dennis's face, and so I'd never forget what he looked like. I thought I was going to paint caution tape. I thought I was going to use red paint and paint blood. And with all the art supplies sitting there to start, I couldn't. And it occurred to me I couldn't because that's not what I needed to be reminded of. Really, what I needed to remember was that life was beautiful. I needed to go in my studio and paint koi fish out of glitter. I needed to remember that hope wasn't lost. I needed to remember that even though something so horrible had happened that there was a future to go forward to. And so in the darkest places, I invite women and children to come paint with me. We go to alleys, and I pick up heroin needles with a magnet that's glued to the end of a stir stick, paint stir stick, and clean them up. I take the places that we are most afraid of for good reasons. Cities were designed by men. And those men, when they were designing cities, didn't think that a woman would ever be walking around unaccompanied. But I park my car all the time, and I'll avoid an alley by walking four extra blocks to not have to walk through a space that has huge visual obstructions, as in dumpsters, where somebody can jump out at me at night. If I screamed, there aren't windows on the sides of alleys for somebody to even be able to look out to see if I was okay. And those alleys are every other street, half the streets of Sacramento and most major cities. They're places not designed for women and children. So I can't say that we reclaim that space because it wasn't ours to begin with. So I'm going to say that we're going to claim that space. And if you want to make something safe and beautiful and inspire people to come play, you need to get everybody's cameras out, right? Like, if you want to take a selfie there, then you have all these people standing with cameras. And you know what? People doing sketchy things that maybe are up to no good really don't want. They don't want to be around a mom and a toddler who has her camera out, right? There's nowhere to hide there. So by taking the scariest places, the darkest places, to make the world beautiful has become my absolute passion in life. And it's been amazing to watch how that foot traffic changes in a place that women never went to, that kids never went to, that all of a sudden has people 
posing and making places on Instagram. I got a phone call the other day from somebody just asking where one of my murals was, and they were like, oh, was it in a museum or an art gallery? I was like, no, it's on a retaining wall that backs up to the railroad tracks. To watch that space completely transform, where people with their groomed dogs are driving their Mercedes to an alley to take a picture, where women are flying up from LA with their entire bridal party to take a picture in their gown in an alley, is one of the most amazing things that I've ever gotten to be a part of. Because laughter is the battle cry for those who refuse to be afraid. And I refuse to be afraid of humankind. Instead, I want to celebrate the fact there's a lot of kind humans. I thought my entire life was almost preordained. I was going to have this amazing family and go to college and everything was going to be like every other experience that my family had ever had. And that's not what happened. I have had to fight like through hell to get back to this place where I can show my son that it's safe. And I will spend the rest of my life trying to make this world we all live in a little bit more beautiful. Thank you.